Welcome. My name is Other Strotterman, and I teach AP Physics at Lawrence Free State High School, home of the Firebirds in beautiful Lawrence, Kansas. Thank you for joining me for this AP Daily Practice Session for AP Physics 2. We're going to look at a free response question in this video. Let's go ahead and get started with a quick look at the free response section of the AP Physics 2 exam. It's the second half. The first half are 50 multiple choice questions. Ms. Mosley has a a video about that that you can look at as well in the AP Daily Practice videos. The second half, I'm going to do one of the questions, specifically the paragraph argument short answer question. That's a lot of words. The important part about this question is there's like half of the 10 points is one big thing you're going to write. And let's start off by talking about a method that you can use, a way you can think about approaching writing this kind of longer form response. And we're going to choose something that you're probably familiar with, which is claim evidence reasoning, CER. This is a framework for writing scientific arguments. It's a great framework that you can use for this paragraph argument short answer for response question. That's what the FRQ stands for, by the way. And I like it because you're probably familiar with it from other classes. So let's talk about the CER and what it means for us. For us, it means that the C, which stands for claim, is just what the answer to the question is. I think the particle is going to be deflected down. That is the answer to the, the claim. The evidence is that the charged particle is moving in this direction and the magnetic field is in that direction. You're deciding evidence from the problem. And then the reasoning would be using some phys physics principle. Because of the right-hand rule, I said that the velocity was in this direction, the magnetic field was in that direction. So because of the right-hand rule, which would be your reasoning, I think that the particle is deflected in a certain direction. The claim would be that certain direction. Now you notice that there at the end there, I kind of said things in a little bit different order, and I had the claim near the end. And this is my suggestion, is to think about the order that you do claim evidence reasoning. And the reason I mentioned that is that I don't think making the claim at the beginning is the best approach. I think having the claim at the end is the best approach for two reasons. One is that you you just have a gut answer at the beginning when you look at the question and then you just write it down and then you just force physics to go that direction even though it doesn't want to go. And so you say a bunch of physics things but doesn't match the claim that you made. Instead, say all of the evidence and the physics things and then make the claim. Another reason for this is that if you're not focusing on all the things that you see, the evidence and all the reasoning, you may not say all the things, get all of the points. So my suggestion is to take that claim, evidence, reasoning, order, claim, then evidence, then reasoning, and then do a little bit of switcheroo and have evidence, then reasoning, have those be your focus points, and then the claim at the end. Sometimes the claim is maybe one of the points, but the evidence and the reasoning are two or three of the points. And so focusing on the evidence and the reasoning is going to be where you want to have as your possible approach to answering these short answer paragraph argument questions. We're going to look at a paragraph question from the 2018 AP Physics 2 exam, specifically FRQ number one. Remember, you can download that from the PDF in the link or in the link below if you're looking at YouTube. This is about magnetism and electromagnetic induction. So here's my scenario. You've got a conducting loop that's moving to the right. You've got a uniform magnetic field represented by the B that's directed into the page. They're always going to tell you what the X and the dots mean. In this case, it's into the page. And the magnetic field is zero outside of this region. So you notice that kind of in this kind of defined region inside the magnetic field uniform into the page. Outside of it, there's no magnetic field. And this loop is moving at a constant speed, very important, into that region. And the question says, compare the magnitude and direction. They ask you two things of the current at times T1, T2, and T3. Include an explanation of why there is or is not a current and the direction of the current if one is present. And then, of course, cite physics principles to support your answer. So they've kind of given you a list of things to say. What's the current at 
at time one, what's the current at time two, what's the current at time three, and they're just comparing the magnitudes. Which one's the biggest, which one's the smallest, is there any of them that are um, zero, if there's not a current, and what's the direction at each of those points, if there is current in my conducting loop. So let's look at the points. The first point is for indicating that the currents at T1 and T2 have equal non-zero magnitudes are in, and are in the same direction. And we know that because what induces the current is an induced EMF. And that's a result of a changing flux, a changing magnetic flux, the number of X's in the loop. And that the EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux. And at T1 and T2, since the loop is moving at a constant speed and the magnetic field is constant, the rate of change of flux is constant. So the EMF is constant. So the current is constant. So at T1 and T2, equal non-zero magnitudes, same direction. Because the flux is increasing, so the current is going to be in the same direction in both of those spots. No current at time three because it's all the way inside, the flux isn't changing, no change in flux, no EMF, no EMF, no current. Correctly indicating that the currents depend on the change in flux through the loop or the forces on the charges moving in the field. So that second part is if you think about there being conventional charges, conventional current in the loop, that as I move it into the field, it feels a force. The last point is for correctly indicating the direction the current is counterclockwise and either explaining the direction of the current generates a magnetic field that opposes a change in flux or analyzing the force. And then that last point is that logical, relevant, internally consistent. Make sure you don't ramble. Make sure you don't contradict yourself. Make sure you stay on topic. Those are ways that you can ensure that you get that last point. Whoa, switcheroo. This happens sometimes in these longer physics two for response questions. It's still talking about a magnetic field, but now instead of a conducting loop going into it, there's a proton going into it. So there's a slight topic shift. Now, instead of a loop, there's a single charged particle. And then it says, what is the magnitude of the force on the proton? So I know my equation for the force on a moving charged particle in the magnetic field is QVB. And so my equation correctly substitution into the correct expression, and that correct expression, of course, is QVB. They give us the V as three times 10 to the fifth meters per second. They give us the B, so the V is three to the fifth, three times 10 to the fifth meters per second. The B is 0.03 Tesla. And then what's the charge of a proton? Where can I find that? I can find that on the table of information at the beginning of the equation sheet part of your FRQ packet. And when I do that, I see that it's the same charge, of course, as an electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And I do my math, and I get 1.4 times 10 to the negative 15 newtons. Now look, look closely. And correct units. We like to have a, a part of the... FRQ portion of the exam where you have to include units, and this is one where you have to. It's a pretty straightforward calculation, and it's a new unit. It's not listed in the prompt, so that's the kind we kind of like to pick. On the figure below, sketch a possible path of the proton as it passes through the magnetic field. Clearly label the path P1. Now, one of the first things you want to think about is that proton. It doesn't say it's a positively charged particle, but it's implied, of course, because a proton is positively charged. So be thinking about what type of charge that charged object has. And one of the ways they kind of like to do it in AP physics is either, either say it's a proton or an electron. They don't come out and say positive or negative, but you should know that a proton is positive and an electron is negative. Now, what I'm going to be doing is kind of doing the right-hand rule here a little bit. And I'm going to try to do it outside of the camera. Because whenever you watch any videos getting prepped for the magnetism portion of the exam, you may notice that some teachers have different versions of the right-hand rule. Some may have the pointy, maybe the palm, maybe the curl. Those are all different ways. The other reason I don't want to I want to have my I don't want to have my hands up here 
is that things are reversed, obviously. And so I don't want to mix you up. So for drawing a curved arc through the field, curved upward where the proton enters. And it can't be anything more than a semicircle. And the reason for that is because the magnetic force is always acting perpendicular to the direction of velocity. So it's acting as a circular motion causing force. Sometimes folks call those centripetal forces. So it can't be anything more than a half circle because as soon as it enters here, that when it goes, when it's gonna go up, that somewhere along this line is its center of the circle that it makes. What it can't do is go in and go like that. That would only happen if the magnetic field was changing magnitude. So the most it can do is come in and do a half circle. The least it can do is have a really big radius and go all the way there. I would suggest something in between, and you'll notice what they do is have a path there. And this is clearly labeled a path P1. I'm betting they're going to want us to have another path here in just a second. Let's see what they ask. A second proton enters the magnetic field at the same point and from the same direction, but at a greater speed than the first proton. How is that going to interact with things? Well, I'm going to need to think about that QVB acting as a centripetal force, that my QVB is acting as a centripetal force. And if I cancel my V this power up here and solve for R, I get MV over QB. And they said that they increased the V and kept everything else the same. So if I make the numerator bigger, then my radius will be bigger. And let's see what they've got. For drawing a path with a larger radius that is consistent. And look, they've got it labeled path P2 there. And the last thing it asks us to do, I think this is the last one, is they say that an electric field is applied to the same region as the magnetic field. Calculate the magnitude and indicate the direction. Magnitude and direction. Make sure you read the questions very closely because a lot of times you can like you, you can see all the different things they're asking for and you can figure out how many points this part's worth. They want the magnitude and they want the direction. Let's see if we can figure that out. For indicating direction, electric field that is consistent with a response from V double I. So if you made a boo boo and double I and it was curved downwards, then upwards would be okay. But since the particle curved upwards because of the magnetic force, then you would want electric field pointing downwards. And you'll notice that they give you kind of a little axis here, which in this case would be negative Y down would be okay as well. And then for equating the electric force and magnetic forces, so that's my QE equals QVB. You notice my Qs cancel. And my E is equal to the velocity times the magnetic field, which is the information they gave us up there. And then finally, I multiply those two numbers together. And I get an electric field of magnitude 9,000 newtons per coulomb. Don't forget the little units there. 9,000 newtons per coulomb. Thank you so much for joining me for this AP Daily Practice Session to help you review for the AP Physics 2 exam. You're going to do an amazing job and hopefully made your review a little more fluid.